I'm an attorney with 30 years experience in international trade law and a certified U.S. export compliance officer. With that background, I've become passionate in learning to talk about economic sanctions like a White House insider, all modesty aside, and in learning how to improve on economic sanctions. To understand how to improve on economic sanctions, it's necessary to understand how economic sanctions programs fail. And with that information, you might become either uh, hopelessly exasperated or perhaps you might be inspired as I am to join the, the debate uh, with vigor and, and with uh, a keen desire to make a difference. Well, uh, let me talk a little bit about what economic sanctions are. When international diplomacy fails, economic sanctions end up being the tool of first resort. Sanctions are designed to apply economic pressure against uh, bad actors in an attempt to change their behavior either willingly or, if not so willingly, through an, uh, a sparking internal civil war with a view to overthrowing the dictator themselves. And, and we, actually, we actually saw this with regard to Libya's Muammar Gaddafi, right? Um, when sanctions programs themselves fail, unfortunately, uh, there's not a lot of room left for the government in terms of wiggle room. In, in fact, the government is left with two rather unpalatable choices. One is through covert operations, and the other through outright military intervention. And of course, both of these, as you can imagine, are such unpalatable options because they come at great taxpayer expense, and even at grave potential loss for life among military personnel. So um, you might be wondering, gee whiz, which governmental body or person is it that gets to decide when to sanction? Well, ta-da, my slide. Well, it's, it's actually the POTUS. And POTUS comes from Twitter, where an economy of words matters. And POTUS stands for the President of the United States. Sanctions programs, although rooted in statutes initially, always come about through executive orders. The president first, in consultation with intelligence agencies, has to declare an, a, a, a national emergency. And the agencies that the president consults with include the Central Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, uh, the Interpol Group, and also the Departments of Defense and State, among others. And these national emergencies are heavy duty stuff, right? They Im impact the United States' uh, national security, foreign policy, even the economic interests of the United States. Examples of those might be weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, chemical, biological warfare, and the systems to deliver the same, right? So, so missile proliferation is a big concern. Human rights abuses is a big concern. And now here recently, even interference with democratic processes is, is a big concern. Well, uh, you might be wondering, how is it that economic sanctions get enforced? Well, there is a, an office called the uh, US Department of Treasury's Office of Foreign Asset Control. This is a very powerful office, not well-staffed, not well-funded, mind you, but they have the ability to shut out parties from the U.S. financial system, as well as to freeze assets. The other way that sanctions are enforced might be, say, through seizures and forfeitures, even penalties, criminal penalties included, imprisonment, through the Department of Commerce's Bureau of of Industry and Security and Office of Export Enforcement. My goodness, that is a mouthful. <laughs> it's no wonder it's so tough to get things done in the government these days, you know? Um, but I would say perhaps the weapon of choice that the government pulls out of its war chest is indeed from the Office of Foreign Asset Controls, OFAC. Uh, I used to work for a maritime services company and a big tall Norwegian one time yelled out, OFAC with the A turned to a U. <laughs> you get the picture. This is so, such a powerful tool 
that even last week when the Trump administration withdrew the United States, this was actually just a week ago, May the 8th, 2018, from the Iran nuclear deal, there was already talk about barring certain European companies, right, that were remaining in the deal from doing business in Iran. Well, how do they do that? They potentially bar those companies from the U.S. financial system. Because you see even the Norwegians, this Norwegian maritime service company, needed the U.S. reserve U.S. dollar currency as their functional currency for doing international business. Super powerful tool. Please remember OFAC. Spell correctly, please. <laughs> um, you might be wondering what uh, form that these economic sanctions take. There, there are actually two chief forms. Uh, one is through embargoes. And for our folks from Kenya, you probably are familiar with your neighbor, Sudan, who have been in and out of embargo status uh, for a while now. Uh, but typically that means a total trading block that's imposed against an entire country. And those are represented here in red, as opposed to more rifle style targeted sanctions that come in the form of blacklist designations. Those are represented by the other countries that are in color, excluding the United States. I will give examples of each. So for embargoes, perhaps the, the best modern day examples of those are North Korea and Syria. Both of those embargoes, unfortunately, have resulted in a tragic loss of life, as well as tremendous suffering among civilians. Uh, indeed, the ongoing Syrian refugee crisis is most disheartening and, and frankly, gut-wrenching. The Syrian embargo itself, uh, one could say, is, hasn't been very successful. Why? Well, it was necessary just last month, April 2018, for the U.S. and its allies to bombard Bashar al-Assad's chemical weapons capability. And that's how I judge the successfulness of a sanctions program. Was it necessary for covert operations or outright, outright military intervention? And unfortunately there, it has been necessary. The, uh, the other way that sanctions come about is through targeted sanctions. And we've seen that here recently since 2016 with respect to North Korea. There were secondary sanctions imposed against certain Chinese trading companies and banks that were supporting the North Korean elite. And indeed, those sanctions, I think, have been successful, right? We're now seeing that Kim Jong-un is prepared to come to the table and visit with our President Trump next month, June 12, 2018, in Singapore. Maybe we'll see some real uh, progress be made there. Who knows? Uh, you might also recall back in 2014 when Russia invaded eastern Ukraine and also annexed the Crimean Peninsula that sectoral sanctions were imposed in that case. These were targeted against Russia's finance, defense, and oil and gas industries. And those sanctions have been somewhat effective in placing pressure on Putin's oligarch friends, but frankly, loopholes remain. So you might be wondering, are sanctions programs routinely followed throughout the world, right? If the United Nations enacts it and proclaims it, is it routinely followed? Well, regrettably, the answer is no. <laughs> In fact, there are all sorts of nefarious ways that parties, particularly in third countries, will avoid sanctions. And frankly, folks, these are the modern day pirates and warlords, truth be told. Uh, examples of when sanctions programs fail uh, would include uh, counter-state aid, or an opposing country to a, a particular embargo may actually prop up artificially a, a bad boy. Or also the second way is through what we already mentioned, evasion, circumvention, where a party may just not care to follow the, uh, the sanction or embargo program. In addressing both of those, um, I just want to say that perhaps the best example of sanctions uh, imposed in, at the embargo level against an entire country has been none other than the U.S. embargo against Cuba. And, and Cuba, quite frankly, the Castro regime has been able to follow through quite nicely unscathed in that embargo, by and large due to the counter-state aid of the former USSR, 
and now its successor, Russia. And I hasten to add, by the way, that the United States embargo against Cuba was unilateral. Not even our brethren to the north, the Canadians, they, they actually have laws on the books that make it illegal for their own citizens to follow the US embargo. So I guess it was doomed from the get-go. Uh, meanwhile, sanctions evasion and circumvention is an ever-growing problem. Um, sanctions evasion comes about due to loopholes in the law and due to lapses in enforcement. When sanctions programs are successfully evaded or circumvented, folks, it's very profitable. So just picture this, if you're sitting in a third country and you're able to bypass a sanctions program, there is no competition for all intents and purposes from the West. You've hit a home run. So uh, gosh, there's certain hotspots in the world that are fairly well known for, for being involved in sanctions evasion. Those include, for instance, the United Arab Emirates where none other than Dubai has often been an, a, a, an unwitting conduit to Iran, for example. Uh, there's North Korea that has provided an unintended bridge, or rather Hong Kong has provided an unintended bridge to North Korea. And, and then lastly, Turkey has entered the fray recently uh, as a result of providing an inadvertent uh, transshipment hub to Syria. And, and this is regrettable because these type, types of actions quickly erode the effectiveness of sanctions programs. And for sanctions programs to be effective, they must implement five key control provisions under any effective export control program, namely a control program that covers certain advanced systems, equipment, materials, and even associated software and technology. These types of controls are designed to cover certain dual use items, those that have both civilian and military use. And folks without adequate controls in place covering all five of these, a sanctions program is going to be doomed. Uh, I myself experienced erosion of a sanctions program right here in the United States. I'm not at liberty to tell you about it due to attorney-client privilege, but it does happen. So, so for instance, if technology controls are ignored, the sanctions program will fail. And this is because the rogue regime will already have at their fingertips the production and development technology. In fact, folks, there won't even be a need to reverse engineer the systems, equipment, or material. So you can see this is a serious problem. And my call to action today is to interest you and hopefully engage you in approaching your lawmakers to enact strategically targeted sanctions programs, those that target the dictators, the rogue regimes directly, rather than using overly broad embargoes that unnecessarily harm the civilian populations. Already on August 2nd, 2017, the enactment of the Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act is a really good step in the right direction. That came before the House this past July 25th, 2017, and the House passed it by a margin of 419 to three, and then two days later, it passed the Senate by a margin of 98 to two. And what that meant, folks, is that any potential threat of a presidential veto was non-existent. What made that act so important was if, if the president decided by himself to scale back Russian sanctions, the, the Congress made it mandatory that it be reviewed by Congress. So that there's a, a proper check and balance in there, if you will. So, so this is why, folks, I hope you will join vigorously in the sanctions debate. It is controversial. It, it uh, doesn't always work right. But you can make a difference. Indeed, preservation of human rights and world peace depend on it. Thank you very much.